Hello and welcome to our special coverage of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'm Ladi Akhiri Pugwali, the headlines. Military delegations from Ukraine, Russia and Turkey met UN officials in Istanbul to resume talks on grain exports. G20 finance leaders meet for talks on global food security and soaring inflation. And breakaway East Ukraine state-led defense death penalty as it opens an embassy in Moscow. begin with news that military delegations from Ukraine, Russia and Turkey will meet UN officials in Istanbul to discuss a possible deal to resume safe exports of grain uh, from the major Black Sea port of Odessa as a global food crisis worsens. Turkish Defense Minister Hulusi Akar made the announcement. Turkey has been working with the United Nations to broker a deal after Russia's February 24 invasion of Ukraine stoked global prices for grains, cooking oils, fuel and fertilizer. According to the diplomats, elements of the plan uh, being discussed include Ukrainian vessels guiding grain ships in and out through mine port waters, Russia agreeing to a truce while shipments move, and Turkey supported by the United Nations inspecting ships to allay Russian fears of weapons smuggling. Russia's invasion and sea blockade of Ukraine has stalled exports, leaving dozens of ships stranded and more than 20 million tons of grain stuck in silos in Odessa. The United Nations is also working to try and facilitate Russian grain and fertilizer exports, which Moscow says have been hindered by Western sanctions. Indeed, but there is still a way to go. And, um... Many people are talking about it. We prefer to try to do it. Do you feel some of the biggest stumbling blocks? Of Thank you, Secretary General. G20 finance leaders will meet in Bali this week for talks that are due to include issues like global food security and soaring inflation as host Indonesia tries to ensure frictions over the war in Ukraine do not blow discussions off course. Indonesia said a Russian finance minister Anton Silinov will address the meeting virtually with his deputy traveling to Bali. Ukraine's finance minister has also been invited and is due to attend one session virtually. Indonesia hopes to issue a communique when talks wrap up on Saturday, though its central bank governor said the meeting would be summarized in a chair's statement if that is not feasible. Indonesian officials have noted disagreements between Western countries and Russia on how to word a draft communique to describe the state of the global economy and how it is being affected by the war in Ukraine, which Moscow calls a special military operation. And the self-styled Donetsk People's Republic has opened an embassy in Moscow, uh, one of only two countries to recognize the breakaway statelet in eastern Ukraine and defended its right to impose capital punishment. DPR Foreign Minister Natalia Kronorova said the territory's use of the death penalty, which it has handed down to two Britons and a Moroccan for fighting as mercenaries for Ukraine, was irrelevant to its bid for diplomatic recognition. When asked if capital punishment would tarnish the DPR's image, she said, we consider that mercenary activity is indeed a terrible crime because people, for a reward, come to another country to kill other people, despite having no personal goals connected to the conflict in question. Britain's Aidan Aslin and Sean Pena and Moroccan Brahim Sadoun were sentenced last month after what Western politicians described as a show trial. Their appeals are pending. The opening of the embassy in a building close to Moscow's Garden Ring Artery was a low-key affair, with no senior Russian government figures present. DPR officials uh, planned for a grand ceremony had been put on hold because of the grave situation in eastern Ukraine, which is the main focus of the current fighting. Russia's defense ministry has said that it had destroyed Harpoon anti-ship missiles supplied to Ukraine by the United States in the Berezin area of Odessa region. Defense ministry spokesperson Igor Konoshenkov also said Russia's armed forces were actively detecting potential foreign fighters, which they labeled as mercenaries, aiming to join the Ukrainian military in Ukraine 
even before they entered the country. According to Konoshenkov, the number of foreigners fighting for Ukraine had decreased recently from 3,221 to 2,741, contradicting Kiev's data, which put the number of foreign fighters in the country at 20,000. We recommend these individuals to think twice and go home alive. Let me remind you that in line with international humanitarian law, foreign mercenaries are not considered to be combatants. The best they can expect, if captured alive, is prosecution and trial, a maximum prison term. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky vaguely alluded to the reported air raid carried out by Ukrainian forces on Nova Kharkova in Russia-occupied Kherson, but remained quiet about a Moscow-backed official's claim that at least seven people, including civilians, were killed in the strike and dozens more injured. In his nighttime speech to the nation, Zelensky mentioned ongoing Russian strikes on Mykolaiv, Kharkiv, and areas in the eastern Donbas region. But he said it should also be remembered that even in such conditions, the state takes steps forward in cooperation with partners, institutional development, and, of course, on the front line. And on the death toll on the collapsed uh, apartment block in the Donetsk uh, region, uh, that's the town of Chasivya, it's now climbed to 46, with rescue work still not over four days after the building was hit by Russian rocket fire. Video released by Ukraine Emergency Service showed rescuers working at the scene, clearing the rubble and searching for survivors. Over 420 tons of rubble had been cleared and nine people rescued from under the ruins, according to the Regional Emergency Services Directorate. Russia, which denies deliberately targeting civilians, said that it had destroyed the temporary deployment point of a Ukrainian territorial defense unit in Chosiv Yar. The local administration head of Novaya Kakova, Vladimir Leontiev, has claimed nearly 200 people have requested medical assistance after sustaining injuries in a strike targeting the Ukrainian city adding that local authorities did not count minor scratches, referring to light wounds that were treated on the sport. At least seven people died in that attack, uh, allegedly carried out by Kiev. Mr. Leontiev told TASS News Agency that 187 people injured in the strike sought medical assistance, adding that the authorities managed to provide the necessary aid to only 90 of them. In Novaya Kakova, in addition to those killed, the explosion damaged the local hospital and church, and left over 270 people homeless. Uh, that's according to Mr. Leontiev. Local emergency teams and military personnel are still clearing the rubble and demining the area, and the number of casualties could, in fact, rise. Ukraine is bracing itself for what it expects will be a massive new Russian offensive in the east of the city uh, of the country, where Moscow says it is determined to take control of all of the industrial Donbass region. Russian forces, which earlier this month uh, completed the capture of Luhansk province in the Donbass, have for weeks been shelling parts of the neighboring Donetsk province. Regional Donetsk Governor Pavlo Krylenko said there was a significant buildup of Russian troops, particularly in the Bakhmut and Siversky areas and around Slovyansk and Kramatorsk. The entire front line in the region was under constant shelling as Russian troops tried to break through, but were being uh, repelled. Russian airstrikes destroyed Bakhmut Stadium, used as a training facility for Ukraine's Olympic athletes before the war. Poland's defense minister, Marius Blatsiak, has visited Kiev and met Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky. On a one-day visit to Ukraine, Mr. Blatsiak paid tribute to the falling uh, Ukrainian servicemen immortalized in the memorial uh, war next to St. Michael's Cathedral in central Kiev. He then attended an outdoor exhibition featuring captured Russian tanks and armored uh, vehicles. Mr. Zelensky expressed his gratitude to Poland as it has opened its doors to Ukrainian refugees 
uh, and allowed the country to be used as a logistics hub to keep Ukraine supplied as it fights an exhausting war of attrition against Russia. In the face of the war in Ukraine, Poland is modernizing its armed forces and from next year wants to spend over 3% of gross domestic product on defense. Poland's defense ministry is indeed supporting the Ukrainian army, the might of the Ukrainian armed forces. It proves that we are standing together in this difficult current situation, in this tragedy which is now happening in Ukraine because of the Russian aggression against our country. I am certain relations between our countries will become even stronger in future when Ukraine is a peaceful country. Let's talk now to Mr. Timitope Olodo, who is the president of the African Security Forum and is a preventive terrorism consultant. He joins us from the British capital, London. Good morning to you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. Good morning. Let's, uh, let's, let's start with this story about the meeting between Ukraine, Russia, and Turkey, as well as the UN officials, over the vexed issue of uh, grain exports uh, and trying to prevent uh, a world food crisis. Uh, now, speaking from the security perspective, uh, or well, well, speaking from the diplomatic perspective, it looks like things are simple enough. But speaking from the security perspective, uh, one of the sticking points is that Russia wants ironclad guarantees that the shipping out of grain will not be used as an opportunity for arms smuggling. Now, that seems to be one of the major sticking points. Now, as a consultant, as a security expert on, yeah. this, on this kind of field, how best can that fear be addressed while all these movement is going on? I, I think that could be addressed. I, I think the whole world actually needs those grains to, to be released because Indeed. we need to deal with that. And I think if that window could be left open only for grains and to ensure that it's an humanitarian corridor kind of food humanitarian corridor, if we could use that phrase to allow food to get out, I think that will also help to address some other issues in other areas. It's important to highlight, just like you said, that uh, uh, the Turkish president have been quite in the center of this, you know, speaking to, you know, to the Russian, uh, uh, Russian president and ensuring or Putin and making sure that this deal happens. I, I think this is quite important. And, and I've realized from news that is actually coming out that even some decommissioned area, areas have been decommissioned. So Canel have even been opened and 16, you know, ships have been allowed to take grains out. We need those grains out because everywhere is suffering, including Africa and even other countries far away from, you know, from the scene of the conflict. So this is quite important. I think there's nothing wrong in what Russia have asked for, because what we don't want is for weapons to be going under the pretense of grains being moved out. You know, that propaganda, we need to stop it, at least at this point, to be able to address some of the global crisis in food security. Uh, let's now come to the military situation on the ground. It does look, appear yep. as if Ukraine is, uh, I, I don't want to use the word innovation, but the, I, I can't find a better word for it. It seems as if Ukraine is now going on some form of offensive as well. It is attacking yep. uh, uh, areas uh, being held by Russian troops uh, in Ukraine and occasionally going even into border towns in uh, 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 Russia. Do you think, looking at it from a military commander's mind, uh, this kind of offensive is better than waiting to be attacked and then playing the defense role? There's no doubt. I, I know many of my colleagues uh, that have come on this platform said that there is need for, you know, for Ukraine to actually, you know, you know, you know meet up with Russia. Of course, they can't match Russia in any way. Uh, but my fear is, if they start eating into, into some of those areas controlled by, by Russia and some of the borders with Russia, we've seen the approach adopted by Russia by going to Ukraine uh, to Iran with the plan to go to Iran now to, to order some 100 plus you know, drones, and some of them might be armed drones. So we don't want this war to escalate because maybe it's been uh, contained 
in a, in, in a way because it's just the Russians, you know, taking the war to Ukraine. If Ukraine starts hitting Russia and actually going further, we know they only have eight of these um, of these uh, uh, missile, you know, trucks, which is mobile and making it very difficult for Russia to be able to to actually get a hold of it. And I, I saw from your, from your news report earlier how they were able to pick on one at least able to pick on one that might leave seven but that doesn't change the fact that america is still looking to give them more more supply is coming in, in terms of funds funds of russia is being stopped so this this conflict doesn't seem to have an end at sight and that's where my fear is Exactly. And that brings me to the next point. Uh, uh, many of your colleagues who have appeared on this program and elsewhere have said, just like you have just said, that uh, one is trying to avoid an escalation. But the way it is going, are we not, uh, is, it not, is it not going to be inevitable that there's going to be an escalation? And this is why I say so. The Americans, the Brits, and so on, are continuing arming the Ukrainians. And now, uh, uh, the Ukrainians are trying to go on the offensive, even though you've pointed out that uh, against the Russians, that might prove to be a tall task, but they're trying nevertheless. And if they hit something or, or, or somewhere that proves vital, uh, then the Russians are likely to want to strike back. Uh, and Definitely. then including against those who are doing the supplying, which they have threatened to do before. And uh, so eventually you're going to draw in other people, uh, which we have seen in other places in the world, uh, when conflict like this uh, uh, goes on for quite a long time. So do you see, do you think the possibility is there that either by a miscalculation, strategic or otherwise, we could end up drawing in other people who have tried to remain outside of the theater of conflict if this goes on, particularly if it goes on till winter when people become really upset that they don't have gas to power their homes and other places. I totally agree with you. And if I could become a political uh, philosopher or, you know, <laughs> prophet, <laughs> I would say that that definitely is the, is, the, is the trail that we are seeing. Because we know that both um, Germans, the Germans and the uh, Czech Republic are entering to deal, to deal with this. There is political turmoil within Europe at the moment. And some of those people that might take over might want to also show their solidarity, further solidarity to, you know, to uh, Ukraine. So there's no doubt in my mind that the way this is going, it's not re looking really too good from a security perspective and for the people of Russia. Because we know the areas that are being hit, those individuals have said that some of the people that actually went out of um, those areas that Russia is speaking, you know, into Ukraine, they all spend their money and return back because there was no place and they don't want to stay in hotels. So a lot of casualties is going to happen on both sides. A lot of foreign fighters are being killed, according to Russians. You know, uh, Ukraine is recruiting or bringing together a one million, you know, force. So what do they want to do with the one million force? Of course, to fight. And weapons are pouring in from different countries, there is no doubt in my mind that there is need for a political solution, which is a global political solution. And that's the reason why I like the role of, you know, uh, Turkey in this area. I'm concerned that we've not had more from Israel that was involved before. And I think there's some other neutral countries that need to come in, even including the African Union, to try and bring this field. There's nothing wrong. You know, African Union might be able to do something in this field. Who knows? You know, but we need political, global political intervention from a political perspective rather than from a war perspective to try and find a solution to this crisis. Speaking about the political solution and political will and so on, you are in the British capital, London. Uh, there's a transition going on. Uh, Boris Johnson uh, is uh, just waiting uh, for his successor to be elected by the Conservatives uh, uh, before he steps down. Now, he has been front and center um, with this uh, war in Ukraine. He's been to Kiev twice, uh, and he speaks constantly uh, with uh, 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 the president of Ukraine. He has made no secret about the fact that he doesn't like uh, what Russia has done, and he does, he's, there seems to be some personal animosity between him and the Russian president anyway. So, uh, yeah. but with such a decisive front and center leader stepping back, do you see perhaps maybe the British role too uh, 
uh, you referenced it in your answer to one of the questions. Britain is, in fact, also supplying weapons, but has even gone further. It is training Ukrainian troops uh, uh, as yeah. well. And it is, there's the home program for Ukrainian refugees. Do you see all of this tapering off under a new leader, uh, perhaps, who has different priorities? I don't see it happening. And, and I'll tell you why. Because uh, British politicians are mainly moved by statistics and by polls. You know, they, they use their statistics and they use the poly political climate as a, 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 a guess to how they take things forward. And they know that as we speak at the moment, the British people are still in full support of the Ukrainians. And as a result, whoever comes in want to test their power, they want to go to Ukraine capital, you know, to show solidarity, to improve their, their popularity. You know, Labour Party is on their heels to try and call for a general election. So the more they could do to ensure that they keep their housing order in the Conservative, it's quite important that they show that they're still a power broker and they can face up to Russia. Most of us don't want that. We don't want you, uh, Britain to be dragged further into this war. We want it to be a sensible approach, you know, help Ukraine if you want to help them, but don't drag us too far into it that we'll find it very difficult to step back. And I think that is the approach that any sensible leader that is coming on, and as you know, one of our own sister, uh, British Nigerian, is also, you know, in the tickets. So we're, 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 you know, we're, we're rooting that for her. You're <laughs> rooting yeah. for her, definitely, right? Definitely, definitely. You know, so, but, you know, the way, the, the way everything is going, anybody that step up to the shoes of um, of uh, um, Boris Johnson, we want to show that why they have a different perspective from him, from all the scandal with regard to the gate, you know, beer, beer, beer gate or whatever they call it. They want to show that they are actually strong from a military perspective and they could stand up to Russia. And that is something that has been a trend in the last three to four years of this administration actually stepping up to Russia and trying to, uh, you know, to, you know, bring down the image of Russia in one way or the other. So I don't see it actually going down. I see it actually escalating from a British perspective. Timmy Tukwe, Olodo, thank you so much for your time uh, and perspective as always uh, this morning. Do have a pleasant day ahead. Thank you very much for having me. After the break, Poland backs measures to boost gas security as energy crisis flares. Please stay on with us. Thanks for staying tuned. Welcome back. Moscow's war in Ukraine must not sideline European Union efforts to cut carbon emissions, even as the continent is first to turn back to coal to cope with reduced supplies of Russian gas. And that's according to U.S. Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, uh, John Kerry. Several European Union member states are planning to revert to higher coal usage to produce electricity amidst reduced gas flows from Russia and the threat of an energy crisis in winter if Moscow halts supplies entirely. Germany, Italy, Austria and the Netherlands have signaled that coal-fired power plants could help the continent pass through a crisis that has sent gas prices surging and prompted governments to turn to emergency measures to conserve energy. Mr. Kerry said while a temporary boost in coal use in Europe was a trade-off between security and climate dictated by war, Europe should strive for an even faster pace of green transition. Mr. Kerry was in Warsaw, Poland, to discuss energy policy, including Poland's ambitions to build a nuclear power plant. ...has created, as it always does, some very difficult trade-offs. It may be that to keep your economy moving today and create political stability sufficient to continue the reduction, that you temporarily have to... Uh, use some coal while you are building out your renewables. I, I think the key is what is the longer term vision that a country is defining in order to be able to stay on the track we need to stay on. Because the war does not suddenly, you know, mean that climate steps aside all of a sudden. Climate, the climate crisis doesn't suddenly stop evolving. I believe European governments believe the real lesson of Ukraine and of this moment is not 
that we need more fossil fuel. It is that we need to move even faster, even faster. We must move to the transition to clean energy base. European Space Agency chief says the agency is terminating cooperation with Russia on the mission to launch Europe's first planetary rover designed to search for signs of life on Mars. The ExoMars rover, a collaboration between ESA and the Russian space agency Roscosmos, had been on track to leave for Mars in September this year. But the space agency said in February that Russia's invasion of Ukraine had made that very unlikely. Then in March, the agency suspended cooperation with Roscosmos over their joint mission on Mars in the wake of the Ukraine invasion and sanctions imposed on Russia. As a consequence, the agency's board instructed the agency chief to officially terminate cooperation with Russia on the program. New insights on the way forward with other partners will come at the media briefing on the 20th of July. Ukrainian lawmakers Alexei Gocherenko and Musa Magomedov introduced legislation calling on the country's parliament to recognize the sovereignty of the Chechen Republic of Ichkeria, the breakaway state that fought two wars with Russia in the 1990s and 2000s. The text of the draft resolution has not yet been made available on the website of Ukraine's parliament, but Gocherenko claimed in a Facebook post that Russia committed violent murders and genocide in Chechnya over the course of the First and Second Chechen Wars. According to Gocherenko, Chechen leader Remzan Kadyrov, a stalwart ally of Russian President Vladimir Putin, continues the policy of terror. The resolution is likely a knee-jerk response to Russia's recognition in February of the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics, two Russian-speaking regions that declared independence from Ukraine in 2014 and were subjected to an eight-year bombing campaign by Kiev's forces in response. Latvian President Egils Levitz has said that the country may have to increase its defense spending and introduce compulsory military service for citizens regardless of their agenda to contain any possible security risks arising from Russia. NATO and European Union member Latvia plans to gradually raise its defense budget to 2.5% of gross domestic product by 2025 from about 2% now. But the president says the existing spending plans covered the building of more military bases to accommodate more troops from NATO allies, an increase agreed at the NATO summit in Madrid last month, but that Latvia, a former Soviet nation like Ukraine, may need to spend more on. Levitz also said the country is worried about the aggressive behavior of Russia and the strategic answer is to be strong because weakness means in this situation an invitation to Russia to go forward to aggress another country. We are uh, worried about the aggressive behavior of Russia, and our strategic answer is to be strong, because weakness is, means uh, in this situation an invitation to Russia to go forward to aggress another country. So we have to be strong. The budget uh, should um, reflect uh, the politics and the needs. And of course, now, unfortunately, we should spend more for defense. And uh, that means that uh, maybe in, for other areas would be not so, uh, so big increase as provided for in, in previous plans. But uh, the security is a priority of our politics uh, today. Um, and then me, that means also uh, we have also the, uh, committed uh, that uh, the defense spending uh, should uh, be increased to 2.5% of our GDP. Uh, maybe it would be necessary to increase further because Poland has uh, more than 3% three, three and Lithuania, uh, I think, also. So, uh, but 2.5% uh, is now already committed, but maybe it would be not enough and we should be prepared to that.
Germany's Vice Chancellor and Economy Minister Robert Habeck says no one should freeze, but German households will need to reset their attitudes towards energy and its conservation. He was making the remark at a joint news conference with Austria's Environment Minister Leonel Kostler in Vienna. Mr. Habeck said without private households saving energy, there would be massive consequences for industry and the economy. He also said the energy crisis both countries are currently facing offers new opportunities, such as expediting the introduction of renewables into the energy infrastructure. As a landlocked country unable to build NLNG terminals, Austria is dependent on gas supplies via pipelines from Germany. Let's talk now to Victoria Sereda, a senior fellow uh, forum of transregional studies and a professor at the Ukrainian Catholic uh, University. She joins us now from Iana in uh, Germany. Good morning to you, Victoria. Thank you for your time this morning. Good morning. Let's, uh, Good morning. let's, let's, let's start with uh, what the German uh, uh, minister just uh, said here, the vice chancellor and economy minister that where you are, that is in Germany, and indeed probably there's a lesson in this for much of Europe, that consumption of gas needs to go down. But that is coming at a time that we're getting closer to winter. By September, October, most of Europe will be in full winter. Uh, so how practical, how realistic do you think this is as a consequence of this uh, war in Ukraine? I, I assume that this is practical and realistic to start talking about it right now and warn the population that something has to be done. And I think it's very important to start those discussions because uh, all those countries are democracies and there are different uh, views on how the government should spend money, local governments uh, and or uh, federal governments. And uh, also the, the question uh, whether people are willing to suffer and how much they are willing to suffer because of, uh, of the war in Ukraine and energy cuts. But uh, I'm quite positive that uh, this won't be a big issue. This, there, will, there will be discussion, there will be problems, uh, but uh, we have already over close to 1 million uh, Ukrainians in Germany. And according to the survey statistics, we see that uh, absolute majority are living in families of volunteers or friends, which means that there will be a lot of uh, discussions and contacts with Ukrainian refugees who can help explaining uh, what is happening in the country and why it is important to support Ukraine uh, in different ways, including trying to shift to different energy sources or to be uh, more cautious with uh, spending gas and uh, coal during the winter. Let's uh, let's uh, let's come to you. I mean, you are in Germany now, uh, but as I did say in the in your introduction, you are a professor at the Catholic University in, in Ukraine. So that gives me the impression that uh, you are in uh, Germany as a consequence of what is happening in uh, Ukraine. Are you able to speak with those uh, who are back there? And if so, what are they telling you about the conditions and the situation? Uh, yes, uh, I'm very actively involved both in, in local uh, refugee community and uh, follow many other communities uh, via social media because this is part of uh, my research uh, as a sociologist. And what I see, there is a certain percent of people who uh, moved back uh, to Ukraine, uh, but this is depending on the situation, on the conditions. Those who f who fled from Kyiv and Kyiv region are gradually returning, uh, and uh, they say that conditions are, of course, you have to understand that this is the war, there are some shortages, so shortages but conditions are more or less normal. Uh, but those who, for example, moved back to Kharkiv now are witnessing new waves of shellings from, from the Russian side and, and new life-threatening situations. Similar, similarly, different other bigger cities uh, in Ukrainian east and south 
so in this sense, we, we expect new waves of internal displacement. Those people who are returning might be, might be moving more toward the west of the country or central parts of the country or return to abroad uh, to different countries such as Poland or Germany or other EU countries as a re refugee seeking. Uh, I, I, I would also want to ask you about uh, the situation as it is now. It looks like uh, at the very beginning of this conflict, it looked like it would be short uh, one way or the other, but now it looks like it's going to be uh, much longer than anyone anticipated. And part of that is due to the fact that uh, Ukraine is putting up much stiffer resistance than anyone, uh, particularly the Russians, anticipated. What would you be saying if you had the opportunity uh, that could bring this to a close uh, and return some sort of normalcy? What would you? What are the steps that you think could be followed uh, that could lead to that? Unfortunately, uh, the issue, the question is, uh, when we are talking about the. Uh, negotiations, we, we are talking about uh, quite often about bargaining failures that, for example, there are certain positions or certain issues that over which we or delegations can bargain. But what we hear from the Russian side, from the Putin, we hear constantly one thing that uh, Ukraine is part of Russia. Ukraine could not exist or doesn't exist as, as, as some separate sovereign unity. And then there is a huge question about then what can be bar bargained? What would be these bargain points if uh, the, everything could be, could be discussed? I don't know, resources, uh, territories, uh, Ukraine status, uh, for example, in NATO or uh, other defense uh, units. Uh, is not an issue. The issue is that it's part of Russia and the, the military campaign, according to Putin, should continue un unless it is as, as, it, as he sees. So I'm afraid uh, now there is a big stalemate on the side both of Ukraine, which is constantly showing willingness to start some negotiations and uh, on the Western side, uh, but the Russia is not really ready to negotiate according to some rational positions. However, uh, if we are talking about recent food crisis, uh, exactly today there will be some round of negotiations happening in uh, Istanbul, uh, yes. where the where the some uh, military uh, uh, military delegations from Ukraine, Turkey, Russia, and UN delegation will be present. And the position of Ukraine that this is UN and under UN protection, this negotiation should be happening. I must ask you finally, before I let you go, how are you adjusting? Uh, to uh, life in Germany. Uh, I know uh, there might be uh, some significant differences, uh, language, culture, cuisine, uh, and all of that. How are you making that adjustment? For me, it's, it is quite easy because I've been traveling uh, a lot as a, as a professional, uh, so it was not so difficult. But I think that for many Ukrainians uh, who were not so mobile, Ukraine, Ukrainians quite, were quite immobile before the beginning of, of the conflict. Uh, for many of them, this is their first time they abroad, uh, either in Poland or in Germany or in, in other U U U ES countries. This uh, creates some difficulties because they have uh, to learn language. According to our survey, only 6% of those who came to Germany are prof proficient in, in German, and among kids, only 3%. And from September, they would start uh, schooling. 
or they would have to go to kindergarten. So language is an issue. Um, some cultural adaptation is also an issue depending on the country. The Poland is the closest probably one, uh, but uh, other EU countries require some adaptation, uh, including cultural. Indeed. In, uh, in addition to that, uh, maybe uh, it's important to understand that Ukrainians are not are quite diverse culturally, religiously. Uh, and for example, there is a big group of Ukrainian Muslims, so they should not be taken as a one group. And this cultural adaptation might also take different sides uh, if uh, it depending on, on the group or culture or uh, ethnic background of people who are fleeing from Ukraine. For example, Roma had a very difficult time in, in Germany Me, yes. uh, because they were not let in. So uh, we should understand that this, this is not a homogeneous Orthodox people group, coming yes. to Europe. They are, so they are very different. Indeed. Thank you so very much, Victoria and Sereda, for your time this morning and continue to stay safe. We hope we'll get to talk to you again pretty soon. Thank you. Thank you. After the break, Wimbledon champion Elena Rybakina says when would have been impossible without Kazakhstan's Tennis Federation. Join us again. Thanks for staying tuned. The Polish cabinet has backed legislation loosening gas trading rules, extending tariff protection for consumers, and contingency planning for grid operators to allow for a swift reaction if the energy crisis deteriorates. Proposed measures include a suspension of the rules obliging gas companies to trade fuel on the Warsaw Exchange if a gas crisis is declared, an extension of tariff protection for 7.1 million small consumers, including households, until 2027 and contingency planning for gas storage and transmission operators. Government spokesperson Piotr Muller told a news briefing that the measures would allow use of gas storage more effectively and increase storage uh, capacity. Let's talk to Ini John McQuarrie of our business desk. Good morning, Good Ine. morning. Uh, yesterday, you alluded to it, you know, that it was about to happen. Uh, and then just before we could sit down and continue talking about it, it then happened. It then happened. Uh, the dollar and the euro are at par. Yes. Well, they were at par. There's a bit, there's, you know, uh, there are sentiments going up and down. But yesterday, uh, mid-afternoon at about noon or so or yeah. earlier, it was at par. Euro and the dollar were at par. It has not happened in 20 years. No, it's a drop in the euro into the lowest it hit in Level. 20 years. You know, and uh, of course, it has a whole lot of implications. Uh, the euro is the, the uh, currency used for, uh, you know, the eurozone, which is a combination of how many countries. countries. And that obviously talks about the health of the economy. Uh, we've been talking and about. And that has not been held by all this that we've been talking about as well yes of course you know so what it means is um, for people in the eurozone who used to spend maybe one euro to buy because most of the goods that they use there are denominated in the dollar either right. they're coming from America wherever they're coming from you know most of those importations are done in dollar right. so that means that they need more euro now to pay for those commodities which means that their purchasing power has reduced right. and this has been connected to the issue of interest rate. So you remember our country's hiking interest rates right. and we are saying, is this really going to deal with inflation? So it might become a competition of who hikes the more. So we saw the United States hiking about 75 basis points. Meanwhile, Europe did about 25, which was termed to be low. So because of that aggressive um, hike by the United States, that seemed to have given the dollar some kind of buffer and strength. Meanwhile, because the European country, because of course you remember those smaller 
smaller countries, they want a Hungary. They yes. don't have the strength. They don't. They and, can't and stand they will it. object. Exactly. I mean, even coming to terms with banning Russian oil is a problem. You know, so the euro, the eurozone has not been able to hike interest rates as much as some other countries. Nigeria did 150 basis points. You know, but they couldn't do that, and that is part of the reason why we're seeing this now. The euro is losing value, and um, yesterday it hits being at par with dollar. I've not heard that. I don't think I've heard that since I started reporting. Reporting business. Yeah, indeed. I haven't heard that. <laughs> now, the, the rupee payment mechanism has come up again. I yes. know we discussed this a couple of yes. weeks ago, mm -hmm. you and I. Yes. So what's the update? Yeah, so now um, it's official. India is looking forward to service the sanctioned countries, you know, like Iran and uh, Russia. Russia and Belarus. And yes, and Belarus. So those countries may actually have found uh, where they can get commodities now, which is in India, because uh, they were, they've been having problems, you know, with uh, trade among, among themselves, especially with Russia and Iran, Belarus, obviously, because of payment sanction, dollar is not available. So now what will happen is um, they will have to open an account, which they call Vostra account. It's with an Indian bank. And with that, you don't need the dollar. You can deal with the rupee and then buy whatever you want from India. And India can also trade with them. And then, uh, and then they move on. And you know, we had talked about some of the changes that may occur even when the war ends, which is that the dollar may be losing its dominance in the global space. This might actually attest to that because if China does it, remember China has yes, a plan and, like and that. and they had already said they were going to. Exactly. Now, India has started it and you know Russia already, they have theirs and they even have their own form of SWIFT, you right. know, which will also eliminate the use of the dollar. So these are threats to the dominance of dollar in the international scene and we might actually be seeing a new world order following this. Now, there are Russian gold miners, including the biggest uh, one, this Petro Pavlos, yes. uh, who is looking for money. Yeah. Have I got that right? <laughs> yes, you did. Yes, you got that right. Because, because um, it's located in the UK. It's listed on the uh, London Stock Exchange, but their off-taker is Gazprom. Now, oh. yes, Gazprom, we know, is not the same anymore. So Gazprom has not is under sanction, has not been able to offtake as they used to, and even if they did, they're under sanction. Uh, countries uh, and uh, corporates are avoiding them, so who will buy the gold? Absolutely. You understand? So now they're having problems. They do not have that much fund as they used to. In fact, they don't even have fund. And they're asking for administration, like uh, bankrupts, you know, when people call for bankruptcy and all that. That's the state they're at at this time. And uh, and it also affects to the, the, the next the one. Other, yes, the yeah, aluminium, aluminium producer. I was yes, going to aluminium ask about too. that. Yeah, it's, it's the same thing. Yes, Rosa, it's the same thing. And you know, we've talked about the issue of when when gold the sanction on gold started, started yeah. yeah and then we talked about the indian country where you know they have a whole city where they do deal with it and the unemployment that has resulted from that so uh, um we might say that the ruble is still doing well. We might say that uh, their interest rate and their inflation, that's of Russia, is still doing well. But these are some of the impacts of the sanction that we see spill over to countries or corporates that are closely needed to the Russian state's economy. And uh, these are uh, major. And of course, they're affecting employment, affecting some of the income, because aluminum also is a major, Ma major, major, major source of revenue for, for Russia. Indeed. Uh, Ini, as always, thank you. Thank you. Uh, more on that, uh, you watch uh, Ini and Laddie Williams on Business Morning and uh, Business Incorporated and later on uh, here on Channels Television. Uh, they got the best, the easiest uh, to understand analysis. So you watch <laughs> out for that. Uh, let's take a look at uh, some of the sports coming out of this. Newly crowned Wimbledon champion Elena Rebekina has insisted that... At the All England Club was a collective triumph that would not have been possible without the support of the Kazakhstan Tennis Federation. The Moscow-born Rybakina, who switched allegiance to Kazakhstan in 2018 to get more financial support, became the country's first major singles champion when she rallied to beat Tunisian third seed Ons Jabeur to lift the Wimbledon title. 
The 23-year-old added that it was not easy to transition into a top professional after leaving Russia. The moment I started to represent Kazakhstan, I was just happy that I can continue playing and uh, it was professional career, so no one knew how it's going to be. So, of course, I'm super happy that uh, in the end uh, everything happened in this way and uh, I think it was a very important decision for me. and. Uh, uh, with all the support of the Kazakhstan Federation, with the uh, support of uh, Bulajamitovic, uh, it's I think it's uh, our win together. And so on, on that winning a note that we end the program this morning. Thanks for being with us. My name is Ladi Akhiri Dugali. There's an update at 5 o'clock within the world today. Do watch out for that. The show's back tomorrow, God willing. But for now, to have a pleasant bit with their head.